Well, good evening, everybody. It's good to see everybody tonight. All right. We're going to give everybody a chance to get settled down because I feel like once we get going, we're just going to be running. So everybody, everybody got done what they need to do? Anybody need to? You got your pen, you got your paper, whatever you're going to take your notes with. Or if you're not going to take notes, you all settle. You got your candy out. I'm, 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 I know it sounds funny, but whatever you need, go ahead and take your time. Get it. You go to the restroom. We, we got a minute. We got a minute. Not going to bother me. It might bother me when I see you later, but doing it. But right now, it's like, hey, let's get it together. Amen. Amen. God is faithful. God is faithful. I tell you, I, I, don't miss God in this time. Don't miss God in this time. You know, God is always working. God is always working. But we, we've been learning about seasons and not getting out of season, not missing those seasons. Don't miss this season. Because we, we learn there's, some, there's a time to uh, sow and there's a time to reap. There are some things that have been sowed and that are still being sown that we're going to need to reap later. And if you miss this time, when it's harvest time and you need that, you're not going to have it. You know, if, if I, okay, so... At the beginning of the pandemic, I was all fancy. And I knew I wasn't gonna do this. I started out, I put some stuff in the backyard. I planted some stuff. And like, I planted it on a Saturday and on Sunday, I went out there and looked at it, and Monday and Tuesday. And then I said, I don't really want that no more. It's not as much fun as I thought it was. You know, it was dirty, it was hot. I was like, uh-uh. And I didn't tend to it. So now I look out there and I'm like, I need to go dig that up because there's nothing going on with it. And that's, that's the way the word of God is. We get excited about it and it sounds good and we, and we take it in, but then when it comes to adding to, making sure that it's tended to and making sure that nothing's coming in it and taken away and that it's being watered properly, we just say, mm, God, I don't, that's too much work. I just wanna watch TV. I just wanna, I, I wanna just go to church and I want to sit there, God, and I want to nod my head. And then I want to say hi to my friends and have the social life that I have at church. But you know what you're doing, God? I'm all right with it, but I don't want to be all in. You know, give me some time. I think Pastor was saying about this. You're waiting. You're waiting for this. You're waiting for that. You don't know if this and that is actually going to come. So, so actually what you're doing is you are prolonging. You're not going to get what God has for you. Amen? So, so do not... What, what, what do we all say? Don't sleep on this. Exactly. Don't sleep on it. Because listen, listen, there's a time coming. Yeah. God keeps telling us and keeps telling. And this is not in my notes. This is just something. God keeps telling us and telling us there is something coming and you're going to need this. Yeah. And sometimes we think when we say that there's something coming, we think. And this is true. There's this big global thing. There's this big thing that's going to affect so many people. And that is true. But then there are going to be individual things that affect you, that affect you and maybe nobody else but you. And you know what? You're going to need God. And the thing about it is God is going to be there and he's going to say, I'm here for you. But you know what the problem is going to be? The problem is going to be you. Because you don't know how to go to God. You haven't practiced it. You haven't gotten to the point where you trust God. I'm going I'm to tell you this and then I'm going to get into the teaching. It was something God was showing me when my mother passed. He said, what you can do right now, how you can stand right now is because you worked up to it. Remember when I told you to do this and you obeyed and you thought that's the weirdest thing, but you obeyed. And then I told you to do this and you obeyed. And I told you this was going to happen and you trusted me. You may not have understood, but you put you prepared yourself and put yourself in position. So now all those years, all those times when you just were like, OK, OK, God said, now this got you here. Yes. Now, at any time, had I decided I didn't want to do that when I got to here, when I got to January 25th, I'd have been a mess. Yes. You guys wouldn't see me today yes. and you would not get what God has for you through me. Yes. So. Like I said, don't sleep on it just just because you're young. I'm looking at some of you. You're young like um, Erissa, Eric, Raya. You're young now. 
you're young, Tiffany, and you think, well, God, you're telling me to do these things and you got me in this and you're telling me to do this and I don't understand. Understand this. God is sowing some things in your life. And he said, you may not see the fruit until you're 46 years old, but he's working right now. So don't sleep on it. And for those of us who are older, listen, listen, listen. God is like, hey, look, we gonna talk about Saraya a little bit. She had a baby at that age. God, God is like, what is age? Time means nothing to me. So listen, just because you think, oh, I'm this age and I've missed it and I've missed it, God is saying, yeah, you missed it. But guess what? I'm giving you a chance to get it. So once again, take heed. Listen to what God is saying. Do not, do not, don't despise what God is doing. And you're saying, no, I don't despise it. Then act like you love it. Amen. You either love it or you don't. So love it. Act like you love it. Learn to love it. Amen? Amen. So now we're going to get into the teaching. <laughs> so let's lift our Bibles and let's make our confession. We're going to, this is my Bible. I can be what it says I can be. I can do what it says I can do. I'm about to receive the life changing seed of the word of God. And my life shall never be the same because I came to believe and where I have need. I came to change and the devil cannot stop me by the help of God I shall believe I shall receive and I shall be changed in Jesus name amen amen so tonight we are going to continue on um, our lesson we're still talking about um, how to stay focused and avoid distractions and my portion in this is avoiding the distraction of depression so go ahead and turn to um, actually we're probably not going to read Ecclesiastes, but just re turn to it. Uh, go ahead and turn to Ecclesiastes chapter three and Psalm 91. Um, those have been our foundational teachings. We started this teaching back in, I believe, November. So we've been going through different different things, different ways that we can be distracted and that we shouldn't be distracted. How to avoid those distractions. So tonight, once again, we're doing the second part of avoiding the distraction of depression. So the objective um, that we want here in this teaching is we want to learn how to continue in God's purpose as we go through difficult seasons of our lives without being distracted by depression. And the main points, we have four main points. The first one was we want to talk about the different seasons of our lives. Then we want to talk about God's protection and provision and our responsibility. So we talked about those two last week. And then the third point is we want to expose common lies that the enemy uses to ensnare us with depression. And then the last thing we're going to talk about is what do we do to avoid the distraction of depression? So those are the four points. Um, Last week, I gave you guys a disclaimer, and I hope everybody was here Sunday or you've heard Sunday's message because Pastor Hill laid it out beautifully. The thing about it is mental health is real. Mental health problems are we real. You can have medical issues. You can have hormonal changes. Things can be happening physically in your body that affect your mind and therefore your mind's not maybe working correctly. Now, this message is not telling you not to get those things fixed. Handle that. Once again, listen, listen to the message from Sunday if you haven't heard it. Handle that the proper way. But this, don't discard this message because this message goes with that. You understand God, God wants to heal you, spirit, soul, and body. So don't, don't give up on a piece of it. You say, well, I'm taking this because of this. No, God said, well, listen to this word anyway. So we want to go with that disclaimer. We're going to go through a little review and then we're going to get into um, the new information. And Ecclesiastes, um, I'm actually just, I think I'm just going to read verse one just to remind us. Ecclesiastes chapter three says to everything, there is a season and a time to every purpose under the heaven. And last week we read all the way down to verse 11 and we talked about the different seasons in our lives. And when we looked at this, we realized that there was a season for one thing and a season for another thing and usually the exact opposite. And, and in this, what was interesting, it would give you an action, like a season to plant and then a season to pluck up. Now, those were actions. And then it went over and started talking about emotions. It's a, a, a season to mourn. 
a season to dance. So you can see that even though we're doing certain things and actions, emotions are involved in our lives. We're going to have emotions, so we shouldn't discount that. And even in some parts of our lives, we're going to be, I'd like this in verse, uh, I'm actually going to read this. Um, verse nine, it said, what profit hath he that worketh in that wherein he laboreth? I was reading this and I was looking up in different translation and, and it was talking about, you know, sometimes you just get to it and you're like, God, why am I doing this? It, it just seems like it's, it's coming to nothing. Sometimes that happens, but that's a season. God is saying it's not. Keep going. So sometimes you feel like, you know, God, I'm doing all this. And before when I did this exact same thing, this thing happened. And now I'm doing all this and none of that is happening. And God is saying, just keep going. That's just the seasons of our life. Don't give up. Seasons are going to come. They're going to be good. They're going to be bad. Sometimes they're going to be indifferent. Sometimes you're going to feel like, uh, you know, you're like, oh, I'm really feeling it. And then other times you're going to be on fire. But understand, times change, but God does not. So we can't use the seasons of our lives. We can't allow them to distract us. The enemy is planning. He's plotting and he's finding every opportunity to ensnare you and destroy you. So if he can get you messed up in any way, that's what he's going to use. So you can't allow the seasons that you go through to ensnare you. So whatever issue, problem or circumstance that's trying to lead you into depression and notice that I said trying to lead you into depression, you have a choice. You, you don't have to go there. Now, you, you may have feelings that could lead you there, but you don't have to follow that path. So whatever is trying to lead you into depression, there's a solution for it. God has a provided a way to get through it safely and successfully without falling into the enemy's traps. And we said, cooperate with God, trust his timing because he's working out everything for your good, according to his will. And we went over to Romans 8 and 28. We won't go there um, tonight. Then we talked about God's protection and his provision and our responsibility. So let's go over to um, Psalm 91. And we will read these four verses. So Psalms 91. I think I have a different time. I mean, I'll take that, that time. I'll use all those 10 minutes. Um, um, so Psalm 91, we're going to read verses 1 through 4. It says, He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress. My God, in Him will I trust. Surely he shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler and from the noisome pestilence. He shall cover thee with his feathers and under his wings shalt thou trust. His truth shall be thy shield and buckler. Thou shalt not be afraid for the terror by night nor the arrow that flieth by day. So we looked at this and we, we just wanted to take, we took a little time to talk about that dwell and abide. And we said dwell means to live. Those are very similar words, but they were just a little different. It said dwell means to live, to stay, to be settled, to set up camp. And then we looked at the secret place. It's a hiding place. It's a place of shelter and refuge as a location where one can dwell, applying, excuse me, implying protection from a danger. It's a covering. So it is implying prote protection from a danger and it's a covering. It's also a veil which covers something to make it secret, for some secret from something else. So God is covering you in this secret place. You, you are there. You are covered by God. And then we talked about abide and abide. It was just a little different. It meant to lodge, to stay, to spend the night. One, one thing that I read, it says to kick your feet up. So you think about that. You're getting comfortable. You are comfortable in this place when you abide. And the, and the shadow represents protection. And when we looked at that, we saw that the place that we dwell or the place that we live is the same place that we abide. So where we live is a comfortable place. It's a place of shelter. It's a place of safety. We don't have to go looking for anything else because where we are is safe. We don't have to run anywhere else. We don't have to think that there's a better place for us because where we are, where we are, we're dwelling in the secret place of the most high. 
So therefore, we can abide in his safety and his protection. And you know what? All these things are going to be going on around us and he will hide us in plain sight. He will cover us. We'll be right there and there'll be a veil over us and nothing can get to us. That's where we are. That's what God is saying. Come here. Come here. Stay with me. It doesn't matter what happens. Let me tell you, it's going to be some stuff going on. You're going to be upset. You're going to be sad. Other people are going to make you mad. It's going to seem like they're threatening you. But God is going to say, stay right here. Stay right here. In fact, get a little closer. Come in just a little bit. Let me let me show you this. Let me keep you in here. So we're in a good place. So we don't have to look for safety because we are in the safe place. There's not an, another safer place. So you, you don't have to go looking for it. So when those things come up, when those emotions, when those problems, when those issues, those things that irritate us, you know, sometimes we get irritated and you're like, God, I got to do something. You know, that's a, that's one when somebody irritates you or it's a situation that just gets under your skin and you're like, oh, I just can't deal with this. And God is saying, abide and dwell. Stay where you are. I know right now you think if you do something that you're not going to get it, get yourself in danger. But you don't know what's out there. You don't know. Stay where you are. So when we abide and when we dwell, God Almighty, the creator of the universe, he hides me and he protects me. So bad things will happen. Scary things will happen. You know, when I was putting my notes and I put in the word scary, I was like, you know, we don't say scary a lot in the church, do we? But we say scary a lot in our lives, don't we? You see something like I'm going to tell you, OK, I'm just going to let everybody know, because most of you know, I don't like crickets. I am scared of crickets. If I see a cricket, I'm running. OK, I gave my car to a cricket once. No lie, because I'm scared of them. But see, in, in the church, we don't really want to say scared because is that is that faith? If I say scared, scared, being scared is an emotion. Now, the wrong thing to do is to jump out of your car and just say, cricket, you can have the car. That's the wrong thing. That, but, but I could be scared and I could have handled it better. I could have just killed the cricket. See, that's what I mean. You can have the emotion, but don't have the wrong response to the re emotion. You can be scared, but don't get out of the will of God because you're scared. You can be irritated with somebody. You can be irritated with a situation, but don't don't stop dwelling and abiding in the shadow of the almighty. Stay where you are. So. When these troubles comes, when the hurt, the disappointment, they're going to be there, but God's going to get you through it. Notice he's going to get you through it. You're not going to skip it. You're not going to say, God, can I just just kind of run around that real quick? You're not going to fast forward through it. He's going to get you through it. He'll deliver you and he'll protect you from all those things that could destroy you, destroy us. And see, a lot of times we look at these things and we don't realize that this could actually lead to destruction. But remember, I was giving you the example before I started. Little things got get you to success, but little things also lead you to destruction. It's not like all of a sudden you're going to be destroyed. The enemy wouldn't do it that way. He's, he's putting things out there and little by little, he's lulling you to sleep. So that is God's protection and his provision for us and our responsibility. He will take care of us. He has everything good for us, but we just have to stay in him. We cannot get out. So then we got into um, exposing the common lies that the enemy uses to ensnare us with depression. And the first thing we're going to look at what well, we looked at was we wanted to tear down the lie that as a believer, my life will always be good and undisturbed and that being sad, hurt or disappointed is not part of the believer's conduct. So we looked over there in Ecclesiastes and we went through those seasons and we saw, wait a minute, there are going to be some times when I'm hurt, when I'm disappointed, when I'm feeling a negative emotion or something that is not happy or that I don't like is happening to me. Life's not going to be the same always. We, we have to stop thinking that. We have to stop thinking that it's just going to be a bed of roses. Everything's going to be smooth because when you think that you give the enemy place to come in and say when something when you hit a bump, you he'll say, you sure you're walking with God? Hmm. So that's what the enemy does. But what's true is that there are going to be seasons in our lives. There are going to be things, times that we don't want to go through, but we will go through them. And if we stay with God, he's going to get us through those. So we all have emotions and our emotions are real. You can't 
the worst thing you can do is, is pretend that the emotion is not there. Just, you know, you got to you got to be honest with yourself. You got to be honest with God. You know, if you're mad, like I said, I, I'm scared. I was scared of the cricket. I had to be honest with myself. I'm scared of the cricket. And then guess what? Now, now, now we can work on that. So we're not going to pretend that those emotions are not there. But in the seasons of our lives, especially those difficult seasons, we can't be led by our emotions. So at all times, we have to be led by the Holy Spirit. And we've learned that 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 you, you guys that's drilled into us. We know that when our emotions dictate how we live, then that's when we can become distracted. Because our emotions, we're following our emotions we're, we're, and we're following our emotions, then we're focused on our emotions. So whatever you're looking at, that's kind of the way you're gonna, gonna, gonna flow. So if you are looking straight ahead, you're probably gonna walk straight ahead. If I look this way, I'm gonna start walking, I'm gonna start walking this way. So if I am looking and focusing on my emotions, I'm gonna follow my emotions. And guess what? My emotions are not following God. They're doing whatever they do. They being who they are. We looked at it and we said last week that we can have we can feel sadness. We can feel mourning. We can be discouraged and sad and broken hearted and even have fear. We can have those emotions, but that's different than depression. Depression is something different. We said last week, depression is a deep sense of despondency, discouragement and sadness, often linked with a sense of personal powerlessness and a loss of meaning in and enthusiasm for life. You know, every time I read that, it, 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 it hurts my heart because this is not where God wants anyone. He does not want his children here. He doesn't want us in that deep state of despondency. He doesn't want us in this state of discouragement and sadness where we, we, we feel like we don't have hope. And we've lost the meaning of our life and the enthusiasm for life. That's not where God wants us. When in depression, depression is allowing your circumstances to overtake you and you give up hope. And that is a that is a dangerous place to be, because when you don't have hope, what are you holding on to? When you feel powerless, then you'll do anything. You want to either gain power or you want to get out of that situation. And as believers, hopelessness and that sense of I can't do anything, nothing can be done about this situation. Now, that's what I, I'm going to take a little time here with this powerlessness. So feeling powerless as a person, when we talk about depression, that means that there's nothing bigger than this situation that I'm in, that there is no power greater than this. Now, we're going to talk about being powerless and who has the power. We're going to read that. And we're going to talk about it a little bit more more later on. But I want you to understand the difference in what I'm saying now with depression. It means that, oh, my God, nothing, nothing else. And you may even say, like, oh, my God, can anything help this? You feel like there's nothing that could help. There's no power. There's no power that's greater than whatever's happening now. However, you're feeling you've lost hope. Go over to first Peter chapter one. And we read this last week, but I want to read it again because depression, as we look at it, is the exact opposite of what God has given us. It's the exact opposite of the belief that we have, what he's given us to hold on to, what is real and what is true. So in first Peter chapter one, we're going to read verses three through seven. It says, blessed be the God and father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. So we have a lively hope and it's not anything of ourselves, but it's of by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. So look at that. We don't have to do anything. Jesus already did it. So verse four to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that fadeth not away reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time, wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, 
ye are in heaviness through manifold, temp manifold temptations, that the trial of your faith, being more precious, being much more precious than of gold that perishes, though it be tried with fire, by, might be found under the praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. So God is the author of our salvation and the source of our hope. The hope that we have doesn't come by what we've done or what we can do. It comes through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And the power that we're working in is the power of God. It's not in not ourselves. So when you get in that in, in depression, when you feel powerless, now you're saying God doesn't have the power to deliver you. When you feel hopeless, you're saying, God, there's no hope in Jesus Christ. So when, when you start feeling that, read that scripture. Remind yourself, wait a minute, hold on. Yeah, I'm looking at something, but what I'm looking at is wrong. See, that's when your focus gets off. Your focus gets on this situation and you don't know what you can do about it. And guess what? You probably can't do anything about it. So guess what you got to do? You got to trust God. You got to turn to God and you got to say, oh, well, God, let me, let me see who you are. Oh, you told me to abide and dwell. I can do that. I can do that. So with depression, it looks for temporal circumstances and outward signs of hope. It shifts our focus from the power of God to our own power and our own strength. And with depression is actually the lack of strength because you don't feel like you can do. You know, you can't do anything about it. And you bought into that. With depression, this is this is how you know or this is how you this is this is a sign that you're either in depression or you're going towards it when your choices and your life begin to look different because of the negative feelings you have on the inside then you're facing depression and understand depression is internal we talked about this last week a lot of times we don't know people are depressed because we don't necessarily see all the decisions that people are making they're still doing the things that their routine, but they're doing some they're making other decisions. Their lives are changed because they're having these negative thoughts. So we don't we can't look at somebody. Sometimes you can, but we can't necessarily look at somebody and tell they're depressed. So we have to remember that. And then we went over and we looked at uh, Psalm 34. We're not going to do that now, but cry out to God because God wants to rescue you. He wants to heal your broken heart. and He wants to calm your fear fears. So just ask him, just ask him. He's, he's like sitting there waiting, just saying, I'm waiting. I, I'm, I'm ready to show you my power. Let me show you. I'm, I'm ready. To, what is, I, what is, I'm ready to show up and show out. Yeah. So that's all we have to do. That's all we have to do. We, we don't have to go through it that way. Then the next thing we looked at, and this is kind of where we left off last week. We talked about exposing the lie that God is punishing you for something you did. We're going to expose that lie and then we replace it with the truth that God is merciful to us, even though we've messed up and he's forgiven us through Jesus Christ. So we looked at Judas and we looked at how Judas betrayed Jesus. So we saw he, he let Satan enter into his heart. He got distracted. And then instead of getting out of the distraction, he just kept on. He kept on the wrong path. And what he did was he's like, well, now I've sinned. I don't like the consequences. I'm really not happy about it. Let me fix it. So he goes to the people that he was sinning with. Once again, you're not, you can't get repentance from people you're sinning with. You can only get repentance from God. So Judas goes up here and he tells these people, hey, you know, I don't like what happened. This is an innocent man. I was wrong for that. And they're like, that's your business. Handle it. So Judas is now he's like, well, now he gets hopeless. He starts feeling powerless. And he's like, there's nothing that I can do to, to make this right. And so he hangs himself. He, he, he takes his own life because he doesn't feel like there's anything he can do. So that's what happens when we get depressed, when we feel hopeless, when we feel powerless. We try to take things in our own hands and we don't have the power to do anything. When you are out of the will of God, when you disobey, when you sin, that all means the same thing. You repent to God. That's that's what you do. You don't go to man. You don't just sit and feel bad and let the devil beat you up about what you did. You go to God because God has given us a way out of sin. We can repent. We go to God. We went over to first John and we're not going to go there tonight. We went to first John chapter two and we looked at that. So God is not punishing us. He sent Jesus to take care of our sin. So don't don't fall into that trap. Do not fall into that trap. And the enemy will do it real good. 
He'll just slide it in there. Just like, mm-hmm. You did that? Ooh. Oh, oh, you you said that and now you're gonna go to church? Or you went where on Friday night and now you're gonna roll up in church? And you think God gonna say something to you? And what do you say? Oh yeah. So you come in church. You get here and the words going forth and you can't even pay attention because you got that in your mind. So what you do, let me tell you what you do. You can do it in your seat or if you need to go to the restroom, go to the restroom. You go in the restroom and you say, God, now, now you got to mean it from your heart. You got to mean that I'm not going to that place next week. I'm not doing whatever I, or saying whatever, whatever I did that was wrong. I'm, I'm, I'm ready to quit that God. So you go, to, you get to where you need to get to. It's only going to take you uh, 45 seconds at max and say, God, I'm sorry. I see what I did was wrong. I repent. Grant me repentance. I want to turn away from that. Thank you, Father, and I love you. Turn around, come back in here and sit down. And then when the enemy comes back, you just say, but I'm, I, that sin's forgiven. God, Jesus is taking care of that. You don't have to keep, you don't have to keep fighting with those things. And you know, a lot of times, here, here's something, um, because we're talking about depression and depression is mental and you, you think about the mental thing that's going on, all these thoughts, you know, the warfare that's going on in your mind. You don't have to get fancy when you're pulling down those strongholds and those thoughts. Get you a scripture. Get the one that you can remember. You, you know what? If you can only if you remember it in the Amplified versus the King James, use the King James, use the Amplified. You know, you, you know how smart you are, right? So the only person that's going on between you. So you don't have to be fancy. You don't have to say you don't have to say it the way I say it. You don't have to way, say it the way Pastor Hill says it. You know what you're doing. You know your mind. Stop making simple things complicated. That's what the enemy wants you to do. Make it complicated so you can't do it again. But all you got to do is say, I'm forgiven. I am forgiven. I have I have asked God to forgive me. He has granted me repentance. I thank you for that, God. And you know what? I'm going to continue on with you. We learned this Sunday. Get away. Stop looking back and look forward. God is saying what I have for you is in front of you. What's behind you? Repent. If you haven't repent, repent, repent and come on. And he's like, come on, let's get going. So now we're going to get into the new information. So. We want to expose the lie that I am insignificant. I'm not important enough for God to help me. And a lot of people will feel that way. But the truth is, is that God sees me. Now, when you take these notes right now, make it personal. Use, use the personal pronoun, the individual. So like I'm saying I, you write I. If you need to write your name, write your name. So we're exposing the lie that I'm insignificant. I'm not important enough for God to help me. And the truth is, is that God sees me. His relationship with me is personal. I have a relationship with God. God has a relationship with me. God created me and I am loved and important to him. That is the truth. What the devil wants to do what the enemy does, and we know he presents and persuades. So I'm going to show you what he does. He'll present this lie to you. Now, he's not going to present a lie to you like, like here's a lie. Sister Castillo, 6'5". That's a big lie. So you know that's not the truth. What he's going to say to you is like, you know, I think Sister Castillo's about 5'7", maybe 5'6". That's a little, that's a smaller one, right? If we think about it, because you don't really know how tall I am because you all see me in shoes. I'm not neither one of those heights. I'm shorter than that. I'm not going to tell you how tall I am. So that's what he does. He just kind of skews it a little bit. So then he tells you that. And then he gets you to thinking on that. So he presents it. And then he tells you and he tells you a little bit more about it. He makes it nice for you. So then he says that that would be that would be really good. That would be really nice. Like you think about it. When somebody's trying to get you to do something, they will they'll they'll show it to you and then they'll tell you how good it is. And, and, you know, like a good salesperson, a really good salesperson will not just come out and say, this is how good that is. They'll say, you know what? You look really good in that. Or 
that, that, that really, I'm, I know that fits you. You know, that people like you, yeah, I can tell. That, that's your style. And you'll be like, really? Yeah, that really compliments you. Oh, but, but oh, I'm sorry, you were doing something else. Go ahead. That, that's what the devil says. Yeah, that's you. That's you. That, that looks good on you. That's how he presents and he persuades. So he presents it to you and he's subtle about it. Now, in this case, he's not going to use those kind of things. So this is what he'll say to you. He'll say like, oh, oh, you're bothered by that. That little thing that just happened. That's that's making you a little sad. It's making you angry. You're irritated. Oh, that's not a big deal. Why would you even think about that? You really shouldn't go to God about that. You know, God, God, we're, God got to deal with the Ukraine war. And you're going to go to God with being about somebody being rude to you and being irritated or something like that. That's not a big deal. Why, why would you even bother God with that? So that, that, that's, that's how he sneaks in. Or he'll say, you, you, you gonna, you gonna let that upset you? And you're like, oh, well, maybe, you know. And so you just take it and then you keep it. You keep that lie he told you and you make it your own. Then here's another one. Oh, the mess you in right now, that's your own fault. Remember you did what you did? You didn't obey God, you sinned, you got all out of line. So you really think God's gonna help you now? You don't remember that? You remember that. And we just learned about that Sunday. Don't look back. Don't look back. But that's what the devil tell you. So you're going you to go to God and ask for help. And when was the last time you, you, in, you paid it? You did something in the assessment. You're going to go to God and ask for help now? You think God? You know, that's what the enemy will say to you. Then he'll say this. He'll say, I know you love God, but does God really help people like you? And you'd be like, what? You know, um, you know, you hear everybody's testimony and you hear how they're doing it. But do you see who they are? Do you see what family they came from? Do you see how long they be in this church or what position they hold? I mean, God is good, but he's good to this person and that person. But is he that good to you? And all of a sudden, now let me tell you what he brings up. He'll bring up something else. Like, remember when you missed it? Or remember, think of the season in your life. Oh, yeah, I am sad. It doesn't seem like those people ever get sad. So now you've taken that. Those are just the little things, and, and, and there are more. There are more. He's always at you. He's like, let me just throw it out and see if they'll catch it. Let me throw it out. Oh, I, I hadn't thrown that out in three days. Let me try it again. Let me see where, where their mind is. Let me see if they're weak. So he's using those little things to come at you. He presents these things to you to get you from stop, to stop you from trusting in God. And he wants you to come out of that safe place where you're abiding and dwelling so he can distract you and eventually destroy you. you listen, y'all, he's playing for keeps. He's taking no prisoners. Let's go over to Genesis chapter six, 16, excuse me. So last week we looked at Judas was our example. And Judas was a negative example. Judas was don't do what Judas did. Now we're going to look at something you, you can follow, partial, part of it anyway. So um, we're going to talk about um, um, Hagar. So Hagar was an Egyptian and she was Sarai's maid, who was Abram's wife. Sarai was Abram's wife. Sarai couldn't have children, so she told Abram, hey, maybe you should just go in to my maid and have children by her. So we're going to pick up after that has happened. So we're going to look at verse five. It says, and Sarai said unto Abram, my wrong be upon thee. I have given my maid unto thy bosom. And when she saw that she, she had conceived, I was despised in her eyes. The Lord judge between me and thee. So here's what happened. Sarai says, go into Hagar, conceive, get her pregnant. And that happens. And then, now Hagar's like, I'm doing something you can't do. You know, she get a little attitude. She's a little, she's a little haughty now. And Sarai's like, no, you not. And she go to Abram and she's like, look, this is some mess that's going on here. I ain't fooling with this. You need to handle this. And then Abram says, um, but Abram, verse six, but Abram said unto Sarai, behold, thy maid is in thine hand. Do to her as it pleaseth thee. And when Sarai dealt hardly with her, she fled from her face. So Sarai is there. She, she given attitude. She given uh, uh, Hagar a hard time. 
And Hagar says, I'm out, man. I'm not dealing with this anymore. I'm gone. So verse seven. And the angel of the Lord found her by a fountain of water in the wilderness, by the fountain in the way of shore. And he said, Hagar, Sarai's maid, whence cometh thou? Whence cameth thou? And whither wilt thou go? And she said, I flee from the face of my mistress, Sarah. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, return to thy mistress and submit thyself under her hands. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, I will multiply thy seed exceedingly that it may, that it shall not be numbered for multitude. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, behold, thou art with child and shall bear a son and shall call his name Ishmael because the Lord hath heard thy affliction and he will be a wild man. His hand will be against every man and every man's hand against him. And he shall dwell in the presence of all his brethren. And she called the name of the Lord that spake unto her. Thou God seest me. For she said, have I also here looked after him that seeth me. So here's the thing that's happened. Hagar's in some trouble. She's facing some hard times. She, she, some of the trouble is on her own. But guess what? When we face hardship, when we when we're in trouble, when we're in pain, we have to remember that God's not distant from our pain. A lot of times we get in these situations and we think God's not here, but God is. So when we look at this situation, it's messy and it's complicated. You got all this drama going on between Abram and these two women. It's just it's just out of control. But guess what? God still sees you in that messy, complicated life. I know there was a time when my life was messy and complicated, but God sees you. God saw me and he still sees me and he sees you and he and he will see you. In, in this, you know, when you look at Hagar, she is not necessarily a person of status. You know, I was thinking about this and I said, you know, if this was like a movie, you know, if this was a movie, Hagar. And Hagar was one of the actors. Do you know her name? You probably wouldn't see it. The, the credits would be rolling so fast. That's, she, she's not one of the big names. She's not even the middle name. She's the ones that you don't even know because you've already uh, turned off the movie or you uh, left the theater. She is an Egyptian. And she is a servant. She's a maid. So we, in, in this culture, in this time, she's the help. People walk around her like she's not there. You know, they say things, you know, like, oh, oh, yeah, hey, oh, I forgot. She, you know, whatever they're going to do, they're going to do because she's not noticed. And that's the way people see her, but that's not the way God sees her. He sees her as valuable and important. And that's the same way God sees each and every one of us individually. He sees us. It doesn't matter your status or who you think you are. It's who God thinks you are, not who I think I am. So in this situation, I love this because Hagar runs off and then the angel of the Lord comes to her. And the first thing he says, he, he, the way he calls it is that Sarai, I mean, Hagar, Sarai's uh, maid, Sarai's servant. It's like, OK, I know your name and I also know where you're supposed to be. You're out of position. Go back, submit to the authority that you're supposed to be under. He tells her that and then and you're like, OK, she's like, oh, you know, and you know what I don't see in here is I don't see Hagar saying, but did you see what Sarai did to me? You gonna tell me to do that? No, she just she just keeps listening. And then it gets good. Then it gets good because he comes in, and he tells her something very personal and gives her some encouraging information. And now if you look at this, if you look at this episode here, it looks like Hagar is running away because of the way that Sarai is treating her. Sarai is treating her badly. But if you look at this, what the angel of the Lord gives her, he really takes care of the root of the problem. She's worried about what's going to happen to her child. And he says, hold on, just let me tell you something. I'm going to handle that. Listen, he gives her some encouraging information. And you know what? 
Once again, she doesn't get caught up and distracted in her own feelings. She doesn't get caught up and distracted in the situation. She's not mad because she got corrected and got told to go back. What she realizes at that moment is God sees me. He came by. He stopped. He sent his word to correct me and comfort me. He, she says the almighty God sees me. And then what I like is this part. The end of, of verse 13. Have I also here looked after him that seeth me? So the thing about it is God sees you, but do you see God? Because here's the thing. What Hagar found when she saw, wait a minute, God sees me and he's the all powerful God. He wants to comfort me. He wants to protect me. He wants he's giving me provision. He's guiding me. And that was all there. And she saw that because she saw God. But here's the thing. Had she got distracted by that instruction, that correction, she wouldn't have been able to see that. She'd have been messed up in her mind about having to go back and, and, and be with Sarai. So when these things happen, do you see God? Because God sees you. And guess what? His comfort, his guidance, his peace, his protection, his provision is always there for us in his will. So what we need to do is we need to focus on him and not those things around us, not that feeling when we could get down. Hagar could, got, could have gotten really down and depressed and felt hopeless and powerless in this situation, but she didn't. Now, she wasn't feeling good. Now, this is not a good situation that she was in because she's actually in the desert trying to go back to Egypt. So she, she's in a bad place, but she allows God to help her. So even when we haven't done everything right, understand that God still sees you and he wants to help you. You may feel like this problem that you have or this pain is insignificant, but it's not insignificant to God. He still wants to help you and protect you. He's still working things out. And when you give him the chance, he's going to do it. He's doing it. So we have to continue to abide and dwell. God cares for each of us individually. So he, he's not, he's God. You know, we're finite and we can only do so much. We only have so much brain power. We can only look at things a certain time, but that's not God. He's all powerful. So he cares about us individually. He does not care more about me than he does anybody else or vice versa. God is saying, I want to help you. If it's something that's bothering you that could cause you to lose focus or get distracted, talk to God about that. Don't don't let that harbor. Don't even if it's a little thing, even if it's like like for a while, like traffic was bothering me. I was like, oh, I just can't deal with traffic is just irritating me. And it, it was getting to the point where I was like, oh, and I was like, God, I'm anxious. And he said, be anxious for nothing. But in prayer, and I was like, oh, my God, you mean I've been sitting here being anxious all these days and I could have been praying. And God was like, yeah, you have. But that's that's the thing. You know, it's traffic. It's something we deal with. But if it's if it's bothering you, talk to God about it. And here's the thing. Ask him for direction and he'll show you how to handle what's going on. He'll give you the proper perspective of the situation. You know what he told me, Kelly? It's just traffic. Just drive. Be patient. Get over it. People ain't gonna drive like you want to drive. Want them to drive. And I said, oh, God, you know, you're right. But the thing about it is I could have got all gotten all worked up about that. So whatever it is, it may be a small thing. And here's the thing. It, you don't have to tell everybody that you talk to God about it. You just talk to God. That, that's the thing. You know, sometimes we're so prideful in, a, in of ourselves that we don't want to ask God for help. But remember, your help is going to come from God. So God sees us. We are important to God. Each, in the, each one of us individually, we are important to God. So the next thing that we're going to talk about is the next trick is the enemy wants to trick us into believing that if we are faithfully doing the will of God, we won't have trouble. Now, that's a lie. When we know that because we looked over in Ecclesiastes chapter three and we saw that trouble was going to come. Trouble is coming. There's some trouble you'll have in your life that's common to all people. And then there's some trouble that you'll have that you're having because you are submitted to God, that you're doing his will, that you're faithfully doing his will. But you know what? Doesn't matter why the trouble comes, no matter what, you're going to trust God. So let's go over to um, Second Corinthians. And we're going to look at some people 
who, who were having some trouble. And we're going to see how they trusted God. They, they didn't get they didn't get all caught up in it. They just went on. They didn't get distracted by depression. So 2 Corinthians chapter 1. And we're going to look at verses 8 through 11. So this is Paul here because we know Paul wrote this book of, of the 2 Corinthians. He said, for we would not, brethren, have you ignorant of our trouble which came to us in Asia, that we were pressed out of measure above strength in so much that we despaired even of life. They were like, we are, oh my God, oof, this is horrible. Oh, they, they were in some trouble. You despair even of life? Like, oh, I don't even want to deal with this no more. And here, look at the next one. And then you think that's bad, but look at this verse nine. But we had the sentence of death in ourselves. They were like, we thought we were going to die. We had given ourselves the death sentence. But here's the, here we go. That we should trust not, should, that we should not, excuse me, that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God, which raises the dead. So I may thought I would have the death sentence, but guess what? I'm trusting in he who can raise the dead. Yes. And then verse 10, who delivered us from so great a death and doth deliver in whom we trust that he shall yet deliver. Ye also helping together by prayer for us that for the gift bestowed upon us by means of many persons, thanks may be given by many on our behalf. So it's, it's a lot of words in there. I'm going to tell you what happened, what he's saying in verse 10 and 11. He said God delivered them and we're going to trust in him and he delivered us once and he's going to deliver us again. And then thank you guys in Corinthians for praying for us. And because you pray for us, many people are going to be thankful that God answered the prayer. So he, it's, it's like Paul is saying this thing happened to us. You pray for us, God deliver us, and it's going to affect all these other people. So in, a, in our lives, we're going to experience trials, tribulation, and suffering. But we can't keep, let that keep us from trusting in the power of God, and we can't give up hope. So you can't get distracted by depression because of your situation. When you're doing the will of God, keep doing the will of God. Keep your focus on God and God will deliver you. Because remember, we, we started in Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes chapter three, seasons change. It won't always be like this. We may feel despair. We may feel like this is not going well and I, I am down, I am out, but we can't make choices that are outside of the will of God because of those feelings. So over to first Kings, we're going to take a look at Elijah. So Elijah, we're going to we're going to jump into this. I'm not going to be able to give you a lot of background because of my time here. But Elijah, you know, he's, he's God's servant. He's doing the will of God. He's out there doing it. He's doing it up. So we're going to look at first uh, Kings verse uh, chapter 19. So Elijah's doing the will of God. He's doing some mighty things and, and comes down to it. And then all of a sudden he's running for his life. But you know what Elijah didn't do? He didn't get distracted by depression. So we're going to start in verse one. And we're going to read to verse 16. So Elijah, he, he does this. You, you just read verse eight, uh, chapter 18 and when you have time. Actually, try to read it tonight so you can get a better reference to this. I'm going to go ahead and start at 19 here. It said, and Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done and withal how he had slain all the prophets with the sword. So those are the prophets of Baal. Then Jezebel sent a messenger unto Elijah saying, so let the gods do to me and more also if I make not thy life as the, the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. So she said, I'm going to kill you. Watch out. You got a day. I'm about to kill you. And when he saw that, he arose and went for his life and came to Beersheba, which belongeth to Judah, and left his servant there. So it was Elijah and his servant. He gets to this spot and he leaves his servant. In verse four, he says, but he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a juniper tree. And he requested for himself that he might die and said, it is enough now, O oh Lord, take away my life, for I'm not better than my father's. 
And as he lay and slept under a juniper tree, behold, then an angel touched him and said unto him, Arise and eat. And he looked and behold, there was a cake baking on the coals and a cruise of water at his head. And he did eat and drink and laid him down again. And the angel of the Lord came again, came again the second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat because the journey is too great for thee. And he arose and did eat and drink and went in the strength of that meat 40 days and 40 nights unto Horeb, the Mount of God. And he came thither unto a cave and lodged there. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him and said unto him, What doest thou here, Elijah? And he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts. For the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thy altars, and slain thy prophets with the sword. And I, even I only, am left, and they seek my life to take it. So what Elijah is saying here is like, God, I've been on fire for you. I've been in it. We, we've been in it together. I've been obeying you. We've been, we've been doing it. And then he says, but look at all this other stuff that's happened. The children of Israel have forsaken you. They've slain the rest of the prophets. And I'm here by myself. And now they're trying to kill me. So that's what Elijah's saying. So here, here's what happened in verse 11. And he said, go forth and stand upon the mount before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by. And a great and strong wind rent the mountains and break in pieces and the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind and after the wind an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still small voice. And it was so when Elijah heard it that he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood in the entering in the cave and behold there came a voice unto him and said what doest thou here Elijah and he said I have been very jealous for the Lord the Lord God of hosts because the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant thrown down thy altar slain thy prophets with the sword and I even I only am left and they seek my life to take it away and the Lord said unto him go return thy way to the wilderness of Damascus and when thou comest anoint Haziel to be king over Syria and Jehu the son of Nimshi shalt thou anoint to be king over uh, excuse me king over Syria and Jehu the son of Nimshi shalt thou anoint to be king over Israel and Elisha the son of Shaphath of Abel Mahola shalt thou appoint to be prophet in thy room so here's the situation with Elijah so Elijah was doing the will of God. When he said he was very zealous for God, if you go back and you read what Elijah had done, they were great things. They were great things. He was doing what God told him to do. And he gets in this situation. Now he's running for his life. So he's tired. He's scared. He feels alone. He's confused. He's dejected. He's like, but God, remember, we knew this. We knew we we're going to do these great things. But now I'm running for my life. And these people have forsaken you. And he's like, I'm, I'm done, God. I, I, you know what? I just, I don't even know. I don't even want to be alive anymore. So now remember Judas? Remember what Judas did? So Judas had to have that feeling for him to actually commit suicide. So here's Elijah, and he's having that type of feeling. But you know what he does? He doesn't take matters into his own, own hands. He just waits. You know what? He waits, and what got me is he waits in peace because he goes to sleep. He waits in peace and he goes to sleep. When we feel like that, we should do exactly what Elijah did. He went to God and he said, God, I am not into this. You know what? This is hard. I don't even want to do this anymore. God, I just want to quit. And then he went to sleep. He didn't act. He didn't go do nothing else. He went to sleep. And then God sent, God sent a message to him. And you know what? It was the most natural thing. Get up and eat and drink. So he got up and he ate and drank. He didn't ask the angel, well, what I got to do this for? This ain't going to help nothing. No, Elijah obeyed. So when we feel like that, when we have those feelings, we acknowledge God in every one of our ways. We acknowledge him. We say, God, this is how I'm feeling. And then when he directs your path, obey him. Don't neglect the instructions that he gives you. Even if you don't understand it, just obey Remember, you don't have to understand. You just have to obey. Exactly right. And then if you notice, 
in these times, continue to seek God diligently. When we look at this, when, when Elijah, he eats and he drinks and then he goes back to sleep. The angel wakes him up. He eats, he drinks again and he obeys the angel. and He goes out further. And then he sees all these things that are happening. But he still drew close to God. He was still listening for God. He saw some fantastical things that were going on, but he didn't get distracted by it. So when things like this are happening, it's happening. It, you're you're going to notice it, but don't allow it to cause you to miss God. All these things are happening and he's looking for God. And sometimes we're going to have to wait on God. We have to wait on God's instruction, but don't miss the instruction of God because big glamorous things are happening or it looks like this or it looks like trouble or it looks like destruction. Wait on God. It's easy to focus on things that are big and trying to pull your attention away, but you have to make sure you focus on God. You can be aware of these things because there's a difference in being aware of something and focusing on something. You know what? Throughout this time, there's a timer over here. I am aware of that time. I am aware that it is running out, but I'm not focusing on it. That's the difference. You can be aware of something, but you can focus on the purpose of God. That's what we want to do. Let's go over to Isaiah chapter 49. Excuse me. Yeah, 41. Actually, Isaiah chapter 41. In our times of trouble, in our times of despair, in our times of hurt, we don't have to be discouraged because God is our help. He's our strength. So we're going to read chap uh, Isaiah chapter 41. We're just going to read two verses here, verses 9 and 10. Thou whom I have taken from the ends of the earth and called thee from the chief men thereof and said unto thee, thou art my servant. I have chosen thee and not cast thee away. Fear not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee. Yea, I will help thee. Yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. Listen, he's going to uphold us with the right hand of his righteousness. Remember, he's doing all the work. He's just like, come here, let me handle this for you. OK, just trust me. Just trust me. So those are some of the things that the devil tries to use to distract us with depression. So how do we avoid the distraction of depression? How do we, we, we know these things are coming because the devil is, once again, he's going to use the seasons of our lives. He's going to use different things to just try to distract us. So how do we avoid it? First of all, you have to believe that God is your help. Absolutely. If you don't believe God is your help, then nothing else is going to work. You can leave out the rest of these steps. You can just stop listening now. But you should listen because maybe you'll get revelation later. God is your help. He's willing to help you now and he's willing to help you later. He's not going to leave you. We just looked at that. He's not going to leave you. So the first thing, believe. Remember, believing, true believing comes with an action. So here we come with the action. So the first thing we believe that God is our help. The next thing you do is you run to God. Run and think about running. Running is speedily. It's not slow. You're not going to be like, hey, you know, I'm just chilling, getting up. Run to God. When you run to God, if you need to repent, repent. First thing you do, if you need to repent, you repent. Once you've repented, then express how you're feeling to God. Look at look at what Elijah did. He was like, oh, God, this is this is horrible. I'm done. So express how you're feeling to God. You know, God knows how you're feeling, right? You know that, right? You know that. But here's the thing. When you express it to God and you and you talk to him about it, you are. But you, you are. That is an action of believing because you believe that he can help you because that's why you're going to him. And then you ask him to help you. You say, God, I need your help. Show me. So you run to God. If you need to repent, you repent. You talk to him about how you're feeling and you ask him to help you. And then. Obey what God tells you to do. See, this is where it gets a little sticky, right? Obey what God tells you to do. But God, you just told me to go back and submit to that person who's being mean to me. And God said, yeah, I, I, told, I know what I told you. I'm God. I didn't forget. 
but obey. Obey, remember, because God knows, God knows, just trust God, because you believe God is your help. And here's the thing, if you believe God is your help, you also believe that nothing that he tells you to do is gonna hurt you. Now, it may not feel good to your flesh, but he's not out to get you. So remember that. So we believe that God is our help. We run to God. We obey what God tells us to do. And then we abide in him. Now, Minister Hill, when he talked about when he taught on this, he talked about abiding. So go back and listen to that. But I'm going to give you some things that you do while you're abiding. You pray. Yes. You worship. Our pastor talked about worship on um, Sunday. Go back and listen to that. You worship, you praise, you give God praise with your lips. You come to church on a regular basis. Yes. Then you study and you meditate on his word. You take every opportunity to be with God like that. Because God's always with us, but remember, we got to be with him. Make, make, the, make, the, the, uh, make the opportunity. Get, get, in, get in the presence of God. You know, read a scripture, you know, during your lunch time. You know, make those things a habit. To, to, to dwell with God, to be with God, to, to have his word in you. Don't forsake those things. That's how you're going to abide. So once you abide, don't despise the help that God gives you. So a lot of times this is where we get messed up. Because sometimes we don't want the help that God gives us. We want it in a different way. You know, I'm sure Elijah would have just preferred if God had just picked him up and taken him somewhere instead of having to walk, walk that far. Don't despise what God tells you to do. Do it. In that, we've been hearing this a lot, work within the infrastructure. You're in this local church for a reason, because I don't, I don't see any visitors. So you are a member of this church for a reason. God placed you here for a purpose. Your help the majority of your help, you're going to get from here. You know, your help may be a teaching. Your help may also be someone who comes and talks to you because every joint supplies. But if you don't put yourself in position, if you despise the help that God gives you, then what, what is it going to be? You're going to throw it away. So don't despise the help that God has, give, has given you. And then wait on God. Wait on God. I was looking at this and I was like, man, I think we said this when we were doing the questions from family life. I think we said this every session. Wait on God. Remember, God dictates the seasons of our lives. He has control. Don't get ahead. God is faithful. There are things that he's working out when you're waiting. You're not just sitting there like, OK, well, God. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Encourage yourself on the word. Remember, you're still abiding those other things you haven't left. You're going to keep doing that. But don't get impatient and get out of the place of safety. Stay where God has you to stay. So to avoid the distraction of depression, first of all, we've got to believe that God is our help and that he's willing to help you now. And he's going to continue to help you. Then you've got to run to God. If you need to repent, repent and then talk to God about how you're feeling and ask him for help. And then after you've asked him for help, obey what he tells you to do. Then just stay with him, abide in him and to abide in him. Remember, it's, it's good to say, but there's going to be some action with this. You got, you're going to have to come to church. You have to pray. You're going to have to do those things. And then don't despise the help that he gives you. Take the help. Don't say, well, that's not for me or I don't like dealing with those people. Take the help and then wait on God and encourage yourself during that time. Listen, family, good and bad things are going to happen in all of our lives. When those things happen, we're going to have responses to those things. We're going to have emotions. Some are going to be good. Some are going to be bad. But you know what? You'll have something on Monday and then on Thursday, something else will happen. And you'll have the same cycle all over again because things change. These things are temporal. But guess what? The purpose of God is eternal. You cannot allow your temporal circumstances and your responses to distract you from God's purpose. When you're not distracted and you keep your focus on the will of God and his purpose, he will direct you on how to handle every circumstance and how to express and deal with every emotion that you have. Amen. I'm out of time. 
Amen. God is faithful. God is faithful. God is, you know, there's a lot of things going on. And, you know, all I can say is that God is faithful. In Church of the Living Water, God is good to us. God is good to us. He's good. He's good to everybody. But personally, I can say he's good to us. He's good to us because he doesn't want to leave us. It's like God's just covering us like, oh, let me show you something. I'm going to cover that. I'm going to cover that. Remember when we were talking about the shield and the buckler? He's like, I got you up close and then I got you on the perimeter. God, God is good to us, family. God is good to us. Amen. Amen. Um, let's go ahead and stand to our feet. It's good to see everybody tonight. So let's go ahead and make our confession. We are a people of purpose with singleness of heart, committed to spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ by freely giving ourselves and our substance, staying close to God through fervent prayer and living a holy life. We are sensitive to his spirit and established in his truth as living testimonies, being labors together with God, out of our bellies flow rivers of living water. And remember, we got prayer um, on Saturday at 7.30, and then family life starts at 8.45 on Sunday. Amen? Y'all may be dismissed.